Hello and welcome back. This is exercise number two of problem set number six of group theory. In this exercise we want to investigate coset properties and look at simple proof for cosets. In the first part of our exercise we want to show that left and right cosets do not need to be identical in general. We want to prove this for C3V. I wrote down the multiplication table over here. You've probably seen this before. If you don't, please go back in your notes and try to recover what you, how you construct this multiplication table here. U, our subgroup of C3V, consists of E and sigma 3. Now we want to investigate the difference between left cosets and right cosets. Uh, left cosets E times U is equal to U. This is of course trivial. The next left coset we can construct is C3 times U and this is equal to C3 times the identity is C3 and C3 times sigma 3 can be read out over here is sigma 2. We can do this with all elements of C3V so uh, C3v to the minus 1 uh, times u is C3 to the minus 1 sigma 1 or sigma 1 times u is sigma 1 C3 to the minus 1 sigma 2 times u is sigma 2 times C3 and sigma 3 times u is u again. Now we want to make the observation that right cosets yield different different sets of elements of the C3V over here. So U times E is again U, this is uh, trivial. Then U times C3 yields C3 and then we take sigma 3 first and multiply with C3 and this gives us sigma 1. So we see here a difference. Of course other cosets are different as well, so C3 to the minus 1 yields C3 to the minus 1 sigma 2 or when multiplying with a sigma 1 we get C3 and sigma 1 when multiplying with a sigma 2 we get C3 to the minus 1 and the last of course stays the same. Now we want to make some observations and prove them. The first observation we want to prove is that all elements are distinct in our code set. This proof is trivial given the hint in the uh, exercise. The hint says we have to assume un is not equal to um and then assume that we have the same coset element given by these two elements. Of course multiplying this equation by a to the minus 1 yields un being equal to um which is a contradiction to our statement over here. That one was easy, let's move on to part C. Here we want to show that left and right cosets uh, yield the same subgroup when we multiply with an element in our subgroup. So the statement goes as follows. The, this is all u, which can be seen over here that when our identity element is in our subgroup we get of course the same subgroup and the other element yield us the same subgroup again. So the argument goes as follows. It's a simple argument, namely that u is a subgroup. And this gives us the condition that it is closed with respect to multiplication. And then this argument is trivial. In part D we want to assume the opposite. We want to assume that we deal with an element not in our subgroup. And then uh, we want to show that the coset, the left coset, is not a group. The proof goes by contradiction, so we assume the opposite. Uh, 
and therefore our uh, this this coset must obey our group properties. Namely, it has to contain the identity element. Therefore, we can uh, write the identity in a different way, namely a times an element of our subgroup u being equal to the identity, multiplying here with uh, um to the minus one on both sides from the right gives us a equals um to the minus one. And again by our group properties, namely that the inverse of every element must be contained in our group. This means that a is in u which is again a contradiction to our statement over here. You can observe again that this kind of relation occurs in many proofs, namely that we write the identity element in a different manner and deduce some statements out of it. You will encounter this kind of proof in various different ways. It's all the same technique behind it. In part E, we want to say, we want to prove the statement that either all elements of our cosets are identical or that we have a that all elements are completely distinct from each other so either they're all the same or none of them are the same so we assume that we have uh, only one element in common and deduce that this gives us the relation that all elements must be the same. When we multiply here with b to the minus 1 from the left we get b to the minus 1 a is equal to um times un to the minus 1. Because these u's are in our subgroup this must be contained in u as well because of group properties and therefore we can deduce from that our coset prop property we derived over here that b to the minus 1 a times u is equal to u and that gives us that a u is equal to b u which means that they have all elements in common. The proof of part f goes just the same way. There's the same idea behind it namely to observe that we have a composite element which is in u and it use again the coset property we derived in part c. Here we assume that b is uh, an element b is in our coset. That means that we can write b as uh, element a, the element a times an element u in our group. And that means that a to the minus one times b is in u. And again here we can we can derive this relation a to the minus one times b times u is u again. And therefore we obtain again b u is equal to a u. In part g. Part g is a very trivial statement but it's difficult to formulate it in a uh, mathematically correct way. We have the order of our group which is g and which can be written t as s times i where s is the order of our subgroup and then the statement goes as follows. We can write G as multiple cosets. And the proof is kind of trivial, but we have to formulate it in a, in a different way because, okay, you all should see that this is, should be true. Well, when multiplying U with a every element in G, that produces G different cosets. And these g different cosets must be either completely identical or completely disjoint. So what we do is we take i as being the number of different disjoint cosets. And then we need another, uh, another argument, namely that we can construct the whole group of G with multiplication. And that means that all elements in G are contained in its multiplication table or in other words that G is a group. But it's, it's an argument we need as well. 
So this is exercise two of problem set number six. I hope you enjoyed my explanations. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send me an email. I'll be glad to hear from you.